So I spent uh, the beginning just talking on optimal transport and the, the very basic problem. Uh, and then only towards the end mentioned some results of ours. Uh, the results I'm gonna mention are joint work with Espen Bernton from Columbia, Pramit Goshal from MIT and Johannes Wiesel also at Columbia. Since uh, this is a conference about some historical treaties, I felt compelled to start with another historical treatise. This one is exactly 240 years old. Uh, it's uh, due to Mosh. It's often seen as the beginning of linear programming and optimal transport. And uh, if you can read here the fine print, uh, it's about moving Earth from uh, one location to the other. So I'll spare you the original formulation <clears throat> and move to a modern uh, mathematical formulation. So the basic setup is this. We have two probability measures, a mu and nu on spaces x and y, and a cost function, which is a function of two variables. Um, the first probability measure mu, you can think of it as the pile of Earth that Mosh is facing. And uh, Mosh wants to move, rearrange this pile into a different shape at a different location, which is represented by the uh, second measure mu. So Mosh wants to do this by a transport map or Mosh map, which is just a function from X to Y. And it pushes mu forward into nu or in probabilistic terms. It means that if I think of T as a random variable, then its distribution under mu is exactly nu. So each such T is a transport map. And for each map, we can compute the total transport cost uh, of the pile. Uh, namely, you go to each location X, you pick up the sand corn there, you bring it to T of X, then you have a cost C for that. Then you have to do this for every sand corn. So you have to sum up over the pile on the left by integrating. That will be the total cost associated with T. And then uh, hopefully there are uh, some such T's. And then you want to minimize over all T's and pick the cheapest one. That's Morse's problem. In the simplest case, uh, your pile consists of, let's say, uh, n stones of equal weight and size, if you wish. So these are the n stones here. I have three in my picture. You want to rearrange them uh, into three locations. Uh, these are the y's with uh, a transport map. In this case, that's just the same as picking a permutation where you permute the indices. For instance, in the picture, my index one goes to index one. Uh, my index two goes to index three and index three goes to index two. For each one, uh, there is a cost. The sum of those costs or weighted sum of those costs will be the total cost. Um, so uh, if you're facing a map like the one described here, then all you have to think about is basically, uh, if I change the destinations, for instance, I bring this guy up here, bring this guy down here to get the dotted lines, would I improve my cost or not? And at the optimum, of course, you cannot improve it. Uh, I will return to this picture quite a bit later in the talk. Okay, what you cannot do in this problem is you cannot take this stone and cut it in two. So you bring the whole stone to the whole location. It's an atom in the proper sense of the word. A um, hundred years ago, uh, when linear programming was really developed by Kontorovich, um, he formulated a relaxation, which corresponds to the idea that I can actually cut that stone in half, take half this stone, bring half here, half here, and then compensate by also bringing half here and half here. So that brings us to the modern mosh kontorovich transport problem. Instead of looking at a transport map, I'm looking at a coupling. So a coupling would be a probability measure pi on the product space whose marginals on X and Y are mu and nu respectively. So the set of couplings is capital pi. And now the cost is computed by simply integrating C with respect to pi. So that's the same uh, accounting, if you wish, in terms of how much cost it brings to, to take one gram of stone from one location to the other, like in the map case. Okay, so this problem uh, structurally is much simpler. We're minimizing over a convex, in fact, compact set. And the thing we're minimizing is now linear with respect to the pi. Uh, it's lower semi-continuous. So it's very easy to see that this guy has a solution as soon as the whole value here is finite. Uh, this is indeed a relaxation of the previous problem because any coupling, you can think of any coupling as given by its first marginal and a stochastic kernel. 
And the MOSH transports correspond exactly to those couplings where the kernel is just a Dirac measure. It's deterministic in other words. So there's no randomization or cutting stones uh, into smaller pieces. Okay, so, so far I've, I've spoken of the two sand piles as the givens and focused on, on describing the optimal transport to minimize this. Now you can think that for any pair of distributions, you can run through this problem and look at the total cost. And now think of uh, you know, this number as a function of these two variables and sort of put the minimization in a black box for a second. So then uh, this script C says something about how the two distributions are relate to one another and what exactly it says of course would depend very much on the little c that I used to define the cost. So in particular for suitable c's that will actually define a reasonable uh, discrepancy measure between uh, mu and nu. In particular, if you do it the right way, uh, you will obtain a metric on a space of distributions on some space x. Let's say you take x equal to y, uh, usually called the Wasserstein distance in math or the earth movers distance um, in computer science. Uh, the two most important examples are uh, W1, so Wasserstein 1. Uh, here I've written it for RD, x equals y equals RD. So just take the usual distance uh, to be the cost function, little c, then the script c, the total cost, that's exactly um, the w1 distance as soon as it's finite. Or more generally, take any metric space d, uh, square the metric. I mean, you can take any exponents, but let's say square the metric as a little cost, then compute the total transport cost at the minimum and take the root, that's the Wasserstein 2 metric, and that's by far the most important metric um, in optimal transport for, for applications. What this mechanism does is that we can start with any ground cost or metric that hopefully represents something about your problem. For instance, how hard or easy it is to you know, actually bring sand from one location to the other, whether you need to go over a hill or uh, uh, through a swamp. And it induces a distance on the space of distribution, which is through some mechanism connected at this stage, you know, we may have limited understanding of what exactly the mechanism does. Okay, definitely one, um, one advantage is that we can compare almost arbitrary distributions, maybe apart from some integrability condition, we can compute, for instance, a distance between an empirical measure and a theoretical continuous distribution in statistics, uh, unlike, let's say, for a KL divergence, where such a distance would always be infinite. So in fact, this uh, metrics come with, with rich notions uh, like uh, shortest distance path. So we can interpolate between points, take averages of several points, um, and so on and so forth. Now, the reason, I guess, ultimately why this is relevant is that it turns out that these metrics somewhat are natural in many applications. I'm not sure there's a great way to mathematically prove that something is natural, but in these pictures, all you're supposed to see is that the interpolations look kind of the way that a, a child would draw them uh, without knowing too much about mathematics. So all these pictures are W2 interpolations. You start with one marginal. This is the measure. And this is the second measure here. So these would be mu and nu. And now you look at the path between them in this metric and you, you take equidistant dots. Uh, then they look kind of like this, which is very much like what a child would probably draw if you ask to draw curves between them. Same here, this point cloud goes into these two point clouds or this uniform on a circle goes into two uniforms somehow this looks reasonably natural, even if you do it with faces. Um, let me just highlight, it looks very different from the Euclidean shortest path. The Euclidean shortest path, when you take two Gaussians, is the mixture distribution. So it, you know, it kind of blurs and it makes two small humps or two blurry dots instead of dragging one dot to the other location. So the, it's quite different from taking convex combination in the RD sense. Okay. So um, the, the first objection I have to such distances, at least the first time I saw them, is, well, each time you compute the distance between two points, you have to solve an entire optimization problem. That just seems a little tough. And I guess it was tough um, 
But the reason now there is this resurgence uh, for these methods is that suddenly these are pretty feasible in practice computationally. And so I would say the first um, re-emergence of optimal transport or renaissance is in the 80s, 90s plus uh, through connections with other fields in math. But in the last 10 years, I think I see a lot uh, interest for more applied and data rich sciences. In fact, I'm actually always smiling now. I see a lot of optimal transport mentioned in our statistics seminar. Um, and I don't think that was the case 10 years ago. Okay, so now there are a lot of applications uh, in fields like image processing, machine learning, uh, statistics, economics, and so on and so forth. And I think a crucial reason uh, why this is happening is that approximate solvers have really enabled the application in fairly high dimension, um, which is very relevant. I mean, if you just think of a pic picture as composed of pixels and each pixel has a color, you get an idea of the dimension that somehow you need to manage. Um, the traditional way of computing OT exactly, let's say for the assignment problem, which is the simplest instance, okay, there are classical algorithms like the Hungarian algorithm, uh, the cost would be n to the three with the best possible implementation. Uh, that's probably too expensive for most applications in high dimensions. Um, on the other hand, if you're looking for an approximation, then more recent results show that you can do significantly better. For instance, here I give a result of my former office neighbor, Jose Blanchet and his co-authors. So if you want to have a delta accurate approximation to this distance, you can do an n square over uh, delta operations. Uh, the, the, the little wiggle here means up to log term. So essentially n square, which is really much better than n to the three. Um, and one method they propose is that rather than solving directly the optimal transport problem, they solve a regularized version of the problem, the so-called entropic regularization, which I will discuss next, in a way, you know, for a small parameter um, so that you can control the distance to the target. Uh, and it turns out that this regularization is much easier to compute. Okay, so that's a motivation to be interested in uh, entropic regularization in this context. So that's where I'll move next. What is this entropic regularization? Uh, we start with a parameter epsilon. So usually you think of epsilon as being a small fixed positive number. Uh, and then the regularized or entropic optimal transport problem is this one here. We minimize the same integral as before over the same set of couplings as before, but we add a penalty term, which is epsilon times the relative entropy between pi, the coupling, and a reference. So the reference you introduce it artificially, and in almost all of this literature, the reference is the product measure of the two marginals, um, mostly because this is a very tractable choice. Okay, so H here is the usual relative entropy or KL divergence. You take the log uh, density and you integrate it. And, and that's the penalty. So <clears throat> Clearly, there's going to be a trade-off between two terms when you solve this problem. Uh, you will either take care more of this or more of this. If epsilon is chosen to be large, it means you're putting a lot of relevance on this term, not so much on this. So you expect the solution to look more like the solution of just minimizing this. On the other hand, if epsilon is small, you may expect that the solution looks more like a solution of the optimal transport problem. Okay, so in that sense, you expect that the solution of this whole minimization interpolates between a solution of optimal transport that I called pi star before and a solution of just this. Uh, the solution of just this is actually trivial because the only, well, the minimal entropy measure relative to P is P itself. P is actually a coupling. Um, so the solution of just minimizing this is just a product measure. Indeed, that's what you would see uh, in pictures. So uh, what you're seeing here is you have two marginals. Uh, the red curve is the first marginal, the blue is the second marginal, and uh, you have pictures for different epsilon here. Epsilon is large, and you can see that the pi epsilon, which here is chosen with the uh, quadratic cost in, in R2, sorry, in R1. <laughs> so X and Y would be in R1 here. So the solution uh, looks 
pretty much like the product measure. If you look at the, the heat map um, from I, it's hard to distinguish. Now going to the right, epsilon becomes smaller and smaller. And you can see that the solution starts to concentrate more and more along a line. And indeed in the limit, the line you would see here is the graph of the optimal transport. Uh, in this case, there is a unique optimal transport map, the Bernier's map or the uh, hoofding fresche coupling um, that you could write down in closed form in this, in this particular instance. Okay, so things start to concentrate is still a kind of a, a fattened up line. That's um, basically this fattened up line is that the object we'll be dealing with. Why would you do this? Um, EOT has a lot of very nice properties. It is in some sense a much easier problem than the optimal transport problem. I will mention just a few things on this slide. Um, First of all, we can get rid of these two terms and absorb them into one term, uh, write the problem up to constants uh, as just minimizing an entropy. Uh, the trick is to change the uh, reference measure, introduce an artificial reference R uh, by this Gibbs kernel here with respect to P was product. Okay, so this is the artificial reference measure. Then minimizing entropy with respect to R over the same set of couplings is equivalent to minimizing the EOT problem before. Uh, this problem is exactly the same. Uh, this trick is exactly the same that you do, for instance, uh, we talked about utility functions. When you do exponential utility, you want to get rid of uh, a random endowment. You can get rid of this endowment by absorbing it into the measure. This is the exact same uh, algebra. Okay, so here uh, entropy is well known. Uh, it's a strictly convex problem. It has a unique solution as soon as it's finite. Uh, this problem is also very well known in the literature as the static Schrodinger bridge problem. Uh, in fact, it goes back to a treatise from 102 years ago with a very funky title if you read German or in English, it's something like uh, on the reversal of laws of nature. Uh, I will not be talking about uh, Schrodinger's motivation too much. Anyway, so the beauty of this problem is, is that's very easy to compute in high dimensions through Sinkhorn's algorithm or, or iterated proportional fitting, where all you do is essentially project in an alternating way uh, onto the marginals to fit them. So basically each operation in this algorithm is a matrix vector multiplication. It's very easy to implement, implement and parallelize uh, on modern GPUs. Um, so that's probably what the main reason why this EOT problem has become so popular in the computational uh, community and there it was popularized by, by Marco Couturi. Okay, so uh, one idea is that you solve this problem for small epsilon and you use it to get an approximation of the optimal transport problem. Uh, that's what I'm gonna be focusing on mostly um, it's worth noting that EOT has many other desirable properties. Many of them relate to smoothness. Um, the, the OT problem being linear tends to degenerate when you go into the optimization. Um, so you could think that maybe in some applications you would just try to replace OT by EOT completely and fix the epsilon um, and then profit from the gradient and see what you get. So one is that if you use EOT as a cost to measure a loss or distance, uh, you will actually have a gradient to do smoothness. So you can use gradients descent. Um, a recent idea that I find interesting is the differentiable ranks that were introduced by Katuri and others. So one can think of ranking numbers as solving an optimal transport problem from a list of numbers to the list one to N. Uh, and then you can regularize this transport and get something like a blurry or smooth version. Um, EOT has very good properties uh, regarding uh, dimension, much better than OT, which has a very severe uh, curse of dimensionality and so on and so forth. So let me not go too much into other things and stay a little focused on this convergence aspect. Hey, Igor, uh, what's, my, what's my finish time, by the way? Well, tentatively 10.25, maybe. I mean, yeah, 9.25 9 in your time, so. <clears throat> That's a while ago, uh, in the other direction. Anyway, ah, it's you. other direction, sorry, sorry, 11.25. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no worries. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you have um, like maybe 20 minutes. 
Okay, I'll, I'll quote see. you on the tentative part of that statement. All right, so I want to be talking mostly about uh, continuous and semi-discrete optimal transport. Um, so I, I want at least one marginal to be connected. Main reason is that the fully discrete problem is, is uh, understood in the literature. Uh, that would be the most important problem where, where both sides are, are disconnected. Uh, for simplicity of exposition in this talk only, I'll assume that the optimal transport problem has a unique solution. It's called pi star. So existence is fine. The question is uniqueness. Uh, and its dual problem, which I did not specify too much, also has a unique solution. Uh, it's two functions, one function of x, one function of y. One can always be expressed with the other. So this would be called the contour of which potential of the optimal transport problem. If you have never seen this, it doesn't matter too much. It's just a function associated with the problem. Okay, so we'll see later uh, that pi epsilon converges to pi star weakly, usual uh, weak convergence of probability measures. And we want to say something about how fast this convergence is happening. In the case, in the fully discrete case where the, both marginals have finitely many points, um, Optimal transport is just a linear program, a finite dimensional linear program. For such programs, the um, regularization has been studied in some detail. And it's well known that you have exponential conversions. So a very neat result here is due to John Niles Weed. Uh, take the solution of EOT, take the solution of OT, compare them in, in fact, any norm you wish because it's finite dimensional anyway, let's say total variation norm, then you will have uh, this exponential decay in the distance. Uh, there are two constants and they are uh, known and understood. So they are uh, really described in terms of the, the, the data. And uh, this is even a non-asymptotic bound. So it holds for all epsilon below a, a known threshold. In the continuous case, uh, the picture will be a little different. Uh, let's illustrate this in the simplest and hopefully nicest case possible. Uh, let's take two centered Gaussians on the real line and the quadratic cost, which is the nicest cost and it kind of goes well together with Gaussians. So then you can compute in closed form the solution of EOT. It's a, a joint Gaussian, of course. Um, the solution of OT is also easy to see. It's just a linear map. It's a dilation. If you think of it as a Mosh map, basically it's uh, X goes to constant X and the constant is the fraction of the two um, um, sigma one, sigma two, say the parameters associated with the Gaussians. Um, okay, so then you have to compare them somehow. One reasonable way of doing it is you look at uh, the total transport cost associated. Uh, so this would be how suboptimal pi epsilon is compared with the true optimal uh, cost. And uh, you see by explicit computation that uh, the approximation is essentially linear. The leading term here uh, comes from mass which is close to the optimal transport graph, but not quite there. So if we go back to the picture, it's you know this stuff that is close by, but not quite on the exact line, of course. Uh, that's where the epsilon really is coming from if you just do the integration. So linear instead of exponential, uh, that's of course a pretty big slowdown. Um, so this kind of um, expansion has been studied for other marginals. Um, sorry for not going into this here. We're going to take the more local point of view and focus on a point x, y away from the, uh, from the graph. If you do it in this example, you, you know exactly what this density is. So you can just compute in a forced, uh, closed form. And what you see by inspection is that it's of this form, e to the minus uh, a fraction of the fraction of the two sigmas, in fact, so just a number. And then here you have y, the point that you plug in, and the point where the x would go under the optimal transport. So this is the distance, uh, how far away you are from the optimal transport graph squared. That's what gives you the rate. And at least as long as you're away from the graph, you actually have exponential decay with a known rate uh, on the graph, of course. Yeah density has to explode to infinity. So what we want to state is a comparable result, somewhat comparable result for a very general problem and not Gaussian marginals and not necessarily quadratic um, cost. So let's state one such result. Uh, here it takes the form of a large deviations principle just because it has an upper and a lower bound. Um, roughly the statement is, okay, pi star is the limit of the pi epsilons. 
there is some function i, which under the simplifying assumptions that I made, I can state in closed form um, with the two, with the Kantorovich potential and the cost function. Um, so what it says is that take the mass under pi epsilon of a set C, then it will decay exponentially at a rate uh, at least as fast as infimum of I over C. And you have the matching uh, lower bound for open sets, namely the decay is exponentially at least, at least as fast as, sorry, at most as fast as uh, infimum of I over the set. So if uh, regularity is good, then let's say you take a, a ball, open ball, closed ball, uh, these two bounds would actually match. So the simplest way to think about the result is to say that um, approximately um, the mass of a small ball around xy would decay exponentially at rate i of xy, at least if things are uh, regular. Different way to say a similar idea is on the next slide by focusing actually on the density instead of the measure of sets. Um, so here uh, I have to introduce two more functions. The way maybe the elegant way to introduce them without uh, putting in new math is this is again the same density of the solution of the EOT problem. Okay, it can be shown to have a specific form always which is you have the one over epsilon, then you have a function of x, a function of y, and the cxy. So these two functions are known as the Schrodinger potentials or here the rescaled Schrodinger potentials. And the statement is that uh, f epsilon converges to the control which potential and similarly the g convergence to its counterpart which is already encoded uh, in f as well. So for the density, it would say that the square bracket here tends to the same thing with the stars written, that's exactly minus i from the previous slide, so that um, I would indeed give you the decay rate of the density at the point x, y. Um, let me mention the two results are basically equivalent if you're in a high regularity setting. Uh, in general, they're not actually equivalent and the proofs of these two results are completely different uh, in terms of how we derive them. But the intuition should be, should be the same at the level of this talk. Okay, let me, um, I want to highlight one idea. Um, that's the ambition I have for this talk, uh, at least in a very superficial way. So in optimal transport, there is a method uh, which rests on the geometry of optimal transport or describes that geometry rather. And the concept is called cyclical monotonicity. Um, it's really a cornerstone in the modern uh, theory and most of the modern books on optimal transport somehow develop most of the basic results based on uh, cyclical monotonicity. So the basic fact is pi is an optimal transport if and only if its support is cyclically monotone. What does it mean? Uh, a set, a subset of the product space is cyclically monotone if the following holds true. You sample finitely many points, pairs of points, uh, indexed by one up to k, and you compute the transport cost in the same way how it's done in the assignment problem. Then, this is the same picture. Then you take permutations and see, oh, if I switch the destinations, can I improve my transport cost? That's the switched cost or not. This inequality says that you cannot improve the cost. Okay, so if that's true for any sample you take, then the set is called uh, C cyclically monotone. In the literature, you don't usually see the permutation because you can just permute the indices and use this standard convention. Uh, it's equivalent because you can always renumber, uh, relabel the x's and the y's. Okay, so the basic idea is that uh, the support of the transport plan, these are like the roads that this transport plan is using. Uh, and if you, if you take like an infinitesimal um, assignment problem using those roads, then automatically you should be seeing the optimal solution. Otherwise, you could somehow have an infinitesimal improvement. This is really a variational argument or a first order condition, uh, if you wish. We haven't really seen a direct counterpart of this in the EOT literature. Um, you cannot have an exact counterpart because 
the notion of support is not very informative. In EOT, uh, all relevant couplings have the same support as the product measure. So just looking at the support is not gonna be helpful, but you could just run the same idea of having a first order condition where you perturb infinitesimally and you don't expect to improve. Okay, so if you write it down, just you know, stubbornly, this is where you go. Uh, you will be describing the form of the density rather than the shape of the support. Um, and here I wrote it down for you. So the density, again, I take K points X, I, Y, I. Here I have to take the product of the densities. And uh, here I have the same product, but I have uh, permuted the destinations. Then there should be a specific relation given by this exponential here. Uh, sorry if it's slightly ugly expression. It fits just on the slide. That's my criterion. Uh, if you want it to be more beautiful, what you could do is you could introduce the same artificial reference with that Gibbs kernel, the e to the minus c over epsilon that we saw before. And if you do that, then you get rid of this term because it gets absorbed into the R and things look more beautiful. Okay, and then you will spot more easily that this is directly just saying that the density has a factorization. On the other hand, for the current purposes, I do like the ugly form more. Um, the reason being simply that everything is explicit. So P here is fixed. The epsilon is here and only here. And remarkably, this term here is exactly the one that occurs in the de definition of C cyclical monotonicity in optimal transport. So um, this seems very suitable to link the two problems. So I think writing down this uh, equation is not really an achievement, but maybe what is a novelty is to the idea of let's try to push this and use it in the same way high cyclical monotonicity is used in optimal transport. Um, we have the same basic uh, relation. Cyclical invariance is equivalent to optimality. Okay, at least as long as optimality makes sense, meaning the EOT problem is finite. Uh, so that's the analog for optimal transport. In analog, um, we can extend this uh, in a slightly less obvious way uh, and think about cyclical invariance just as a definition without looking at the optimization problem. Uh, it turns out that there is always at most one cyclically invariant coupling and we can prove existence in, in a pretty general context. So what's happening here is similar to something that's also known in optimal transport, namely this geometry is actually meaningful beyond the optimization. It's not just a first order condition. So you can use this geometry to single out a unique coupling, even if the optimization problem doesn't make sense because just every coupling has infinite costs. So then there's nothing to optimize. Okay, so for instance, uh, if you want to define Bernier's map for marginals that are not square integrable, you can actually do this, uh, even though the optimization itself doesn't directly make sense. So same is true here. So I want to give you just a flavor of the method uh, since I wasn't given uh, that much more time. Um, so here, this lemma is actually a straightforward one. I'm gonna look at the set of points A, which are K tuples of pairs. Namely, they are the tuples so that if I look at the cost and permute the destinations, I can indeed improve the cost by at least a constant delta. The claim is that the k-fold product measure of this set under pi epsilon will decay exponentially with rate at least delta. So the C somehow disconnects uh, to decay rates. The reason why this is true is actually pretty immediate. You just need to look at this definition. So what I'm saying when I, def the set is exactly the set where this here is greater or equal to delta. So if I integrate both sides over the set, then on the left-hand side, I will get the left-hand side of my inequality, exactly what I want. Here, well, on the set, this is at least delta. So this, uh, I'll get an upper bound X minus delta over epsilon. And then here, this is some probability measure. So when you, when you integrate, you get something less or equal to one. Uh, that was the complete proof of the lemma. Um, so, okay, there is a converse bound, which is a little bit trickier that I will not detail. But let me just show you how to apply it immediately and prove at least this one result. Uh, this will give us in particular that pi epsilon converges to pi star when pi star is unique. The more general result is don't assume anything about optimal transport. 
don't assume you know anything, just look at the pi epsilons, which you know are cyclically invariant. Um, these are all couplings. Couplings are a compact set, so you always know that there will be cluster points for weak convergence. Take any such cluster point, call it pi. The claim is that pi, or rather its support, is C cyclically monotone. Um, this would, okay, the, like what you always do in optimal transport to check something like this is, okay, I take K points from that set. I assume that the transport cost is improvable. Okay, then you blow up, uh, make the points small balls. Uh, then the question is, can this uh, still be improvable or not? And then you realize that actually those balls are subsets um, of this set A. So our lemma tells us that the mass goes to zero even exponentially. And there you contradict the fact that you, you started with a support. So support means you actually have mass at those points. So that was um, a rigorous proof of this statement, which I, I'm hoping the simplicity of the argument uh, indicates that the concept might be useful. Okay, it's definitely much simpler than previous arguments, uh, giving the same result under more particular conditions. Okay, so, uh, okay, I'm two minutes over time. So let me sneak in one result <laughs> just quickly. Um, it follows, I would say by similar arguments, it's a different limit, but it, it exploits the same method. So here the epsilon would be fixed. It's really a result about EOT. We're moving the marginals. So assume you have weakly convergent marginals. Uh, take the associated solutions, here they are. And we're trying to say that the associated solutions would converge to one another. Um, and even more generally, you want to formulate this maybe in a purely geometric way using the cyclical invariance. And this just says that you have the expected result. Okay, limits of cyclically invariant couplings would be cyclically invariant. So it gives you that the optimizers, the solutions are stable with respect to the marginals of the EOT problem. Okay, so here I need to end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcel. Um, we have some time for maybe a couple of quick questions. One quick question, and and as usually, you can post them in the in the chat or in Q and A. And in the meantime, I have I, Marcel. I have maybe not a question. Maybe it's like a general question. Can you briefly somehow, but briefly, uh, say how this problem is related to a particular problem in I don't know, mathematical finance or economics, uh, given the audience, we have quite a large audience, diverse audience, without going to very specific applications. So. Um, well, in math finance, we know very well this problem, uh, just slightly in disguise. So let's say I'm doing, I'm writing it in the form of couplings. And I just minimize it with respect to the R measure, which had the C already absorbed into it. That will save me a little bit of notation. That is dual. So the dual of this is what we would call the primal. So that would be soup. And then I take under R exponential utility of portfolio. Now, what is portfolio? Here, portfolio would be uh, a function of x plus, well, it has a minus from the utility, plus a function of y. And uh, okay, here, let's say things that I can buy at zero price. So I can think of these as option written on the asset x, option written on the asset y in a market where I get a price, namely the price of f would be the integral with respect to a given marginal and the same thing for the other guy. So it's a market where I can trade freely functions of X and functions of Y. They are priced according to the two given marginals. I have a given amount of initial capital. Okay, this is kind of translation invariant. So let's say capital zero. And then I want to maximize my exponential utility. The solution FG of that problem those are exactly the Schrodinger potentials in our language. And by duality, what usually is the dual over martingale measures, uh, here it's this problem. And instead of martingale measures, it's measures that have the given marginals that basically fit the option prices. 
Excellent. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, I hope that was helpful helpful for those who are you know coming strictly from from a finance community rather than uh, probability. But uh, again, fascinating theory. So uh, thank you very much, Marcel. Uh, looks like we can move on to the next. Uh,